The first thing to say before even I welcome Dave Cormack is that uh, hello fellow dandies everywhere. Yes, this feels strange. I've loved our club since the late 60s, since my dad took me to Pataudry because he knew that Jinky Smith was just about to go away and he was coming back in the reserves. And from the day I saw that lush uh, green turf to today, um, even though I'm famous for using too many words, I cannot find the words to express how much Aberdeen Football Club means to me, how much I love them, how much they've changed my life. And before we do any questions, Chairman Dave Cormack, it's my belief that when you strip away the rules of your office, when you strip away the, the things you're trying to do with the club, you feel the same about Aberdeen Football Club as I do, or the way I've just expressed it. Am I right, Dave? Oh, absolutely, Graham. You know, um, I remember my first game, my uncle lifted me over the turnstile, um, as you did back then. And Aberdeen, late 60s, were playing Dundee United. Dundee United were in their white with the, the, the black on the, on the collar. And I think it was a nil-nil draw, but uh, that was, I'd been at some reserve games, um, but that was my first game with my uncle and um, just hooked. And you think of the players back then, I mean, Eddie Turnbull, you know, in 1965 came in, wiped out like 17 players, started afresh. And we then saw Aberdeen really take on, you know, a really, really good Celtic team in the late 60s. They obviously won the European Cup. 1970, I was at the cup semi-final, you know, cup tie Mackay, Joe Harper, um, you know, my my uncle and aunts lived in, kind of still lived in three rooms in Spring Garden, and I would go across the road to Harry Dowson and see all these Aberdeen scarves and stuff, and for that first game against Dundee United, my uncle bought me my first scarf, and, um, and so... You know, as they say, we'll support you ever more. We've seen some fantastic times. We've seen some really tough times. This season has been way, way below par, as as as, as we know. But um, you know, it it it's in your blood. The magic never leaves you. Look, it's David. It's important that we set out some terms and conditions. First of all, this this will go out to an audience of people who who love the dandies, some who are confused, maybe some who feel a little bit left behind in terms of information, some who are optimistic, optimistic like me, because I am. But one, from my side of this interview, um, I want to make it clear I'm not employed by Aberdeen. There's a time when I would have paid to do this. I'm not being paid to this either. There's been no um, preparation of topics or questions. There's no script. Um, I haven't told you what I'm going to ask. And I want to make that clear, Dave, because if if we want anything to come through this interview, which which is down to what you want to say and how you want to explain yourself, we, we need people who can make a difference to the club, to the rebuilding of the football squad, to the rebuilding of the stadium, and to listen, to feel a contagious optimism and, and to understand you more. So all those things I've just said, you allowed free reign because you need this discussion this conversation to be fun and interesting hopefully but also to allow you to communicate without people thinking that you know this is a script yeah and and i don't have any notes in front of me um you know um you know the part of the kind of my tenure as chairman has been is really to try and be open and transparent and you know graham i've done it with all my other businesses the software businesses even when we had five six hundred um employees, team members, as I like to call them, you know, I still made myself available for customers and reach out to customers because the only way you can kind can, can of learn. And um, it, really the goal is, is really trying to be transparent. I know that some, some people um, think I'm looking for attention. Uh, then when you say nothing for three months, um, you know, you're hiding. But it's been a tough period of time, clearly, for the club, and I take responsibility. Um, but feel that this is kind of the right time for you and I to have this this conversation. So when we talked, we're going to come back to what was a wonderful and successful couple of days with Sir Alex Ferguson. That is is key because you only get one chance to do that right and you did and we will talk about it. When I met you then, you said a couple of things that um, struck a chord with me because 
I believe that while we all need to have faith in your plans and your vision and your ability as, as chairman and as an investor, I also believe that without people understanding what it means to you, there'll always be a dislocation. You'll always be that guy who's higher than us, who's more important than us, who may or may not be telling us everything that matters. The thing you said to me, and I'm mentioning it now because I think it helps, again, people understand you better, is when you're sitting and watching, like I can name the, the game at Race Rovers, the game at St Mirren, the game at Motherwell, the game, a couple of games in Edinburgh. You're sitting there as chairman, but you're also still sitting there as a fan, peed off to the high heavens, and you still understand what it is to not enjoy your own team playing because of whatever they're doing wrong. And I think, I mean, I'm putting, not putting words in your mouth, but I want you to explain, even though occasionally you're in Atlanta, even though people look at your success, when you're watching that, you've still got the heart of a fan going, I'm not, I'm not enjoying this. This is not what I want to see, correct? A hundred percent. You know, um, there are fine margins in football, you know, in this season. And, you know, um, as I said earlier, it's, it's not been a, a great watch by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but, you know, I sat there. I sat. The games that come to mind for me were after the Hearts game, um, after the Dungeon United game, the Sir Alex homecoming game. And, and to see the team perform the way it did on the Saturday, Right against Dundee United, and listen, you know we should have won the game, but we didn't win the game, and it's and you know the the, the Ross County game last weekend is our season in one in terms of bulk of possession opportunities, one shot against us um, on target, a penalty, and you lose. But you know I sit there at Hearts, there's fourteen hundred fans down there, and I'm sitting there, and I, I actually prefer to spend time with fans than I actually than I do necessarily in the boardroom greeting people. Um, because that interaction is important and it's typically constructive when you do it, uh, unlike at times at social media. But I sat there watching 1,400 Aberdeen fans and, you know, it's it, you do, you kick every damn ball. Similarly, against the Motherwell Cup game as well, where, um, you know, that was after two other away performances against St Mirren and uh, Livingston that were, were really poor. You know, um, yeah, we all hurt. If I haven't found you either unrealistic or unable, you, you use the phrase, and, and ultimately it's, it's vital, I take responsibility. Fine, okay. But responsibility is dispersed because it's not you picking the team, it's not you taking the training, it's not you missing the goals. So I want to ask you straight, if we go back to last March, the appointment of Stephen and his team, and the summer and the beginning of this season, if I gave you a time machine, now with retrospect, what would you actively change in decisions that either you took or things you've seen that weren't your direct responsibility that if you could, you would change? Because I think if you explain that well, people begin to understand your mindset now and where you're at. Well, listen, I think hindsight is wonderful. It's great being, as they say in the States, a Monday morning quarterback. And again, I would just say, look, it's been a really, really poor season. Yes, we can say it started out well. We got further in Europe than we had since Jimmy Calderwood was here. But the cup defeats and, I mean, the league performances, I mean, nobody's hammered us in the league. There's been fine margins. But, you know, when you let in four, when there's four games in the league, I believe, that, that, that uh, we um, have had, um, not let in any goals, you know, it, it becomes a tough season. But let's go back to a year ago. OK, in fact, if you if you if you just let me train a thought. Right. Let's go back before that. I've been back on the board. I was involved for about a year back in 2000, as most people know, um, when I had a sabbatical. Then I came on board and it's almost five years and it's been pretty much full time for five years initially as a non-exec director, um, but then into vice chairman, chairman then what the club faced then, and, and Stuart and the board asked me to put a business plan in place because I had the time, was we needed to not just get planning permission for the new training ground and, 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 um, and obviously where the, the, the stadium was planned to go as well, but we needed to find money to invest in competing in the league 
against Rangers who were becoming rejuvenate, right, from being in the lower leagues. Uh, Hearts and Hibs were uh, relegated in 2014, or back up and, and are very well managed now. And also Dundee United were gone for five years. So you think about the big picture, it's how can we, you know, um, grow the business reasonably because it has to be sustainable and get um, better results on the pitch. It has to happen off the pitch and on the pitch. So we were left with how do we, how do we get the money for the new training ground? How do we find investment to put more into the first team? And from five years ago, right, and my involvement in the club, we've put two million more a year into the basic wages of the first team, which is absolutely significant. Um, the, the, the next, and I'll come back to, to the rationale about how, about behind, behind that, because it ties into the, the, the recruitment and youth policy. I know you'll have probably questions on that. The women's team, how do we invest in the women's team? How do we put more investment into our youth academy, uh, which is now seeing the fruits of Calvin Ramsey, Jack McKenzie, Connor Barron coming through? Last but not least, how do we find significant uh, investment to be able to build a new stadium so the club has the next 100 years? And, and so I'll, I'll come back to answer the question. But, but the, the point is, looking out at this, there's like a 10 year horizon in terms of getting this done. If you look five years ago, it turned out that the training ground cost 14 million, not 9 million to put in place. Okay. And the investment wasn't there when we got planning permission. So I had a choice then whether to solve it or not. I decided to try and solve it because otherwise it wouldn't have got built. Then with the stadium, here we are today with construction inflation at 20 to 25%. So whether you want to build a primary school in Aberdeen, might have been 20 million before, now 25 million. The cost for us to build a quality stadium, a quality stadium where we can uplift our income, our turnover, right? Because we've got better facilities because we're landlocked at the Tawdry, is going to be 70 to 75 million. So that's the best part of 100 million the club needed back then to get the training ground done, probably... 14 million, 6 million to go into working capital. So the club had the money to be able to do the investment that, that we've done. So that's the background. And in May of 2019, we set our stall out on what our aspirations were. I think some people think they're promises that we're going to be in the Champions League every year. But these are aspirations and they're, they're tall aspirations. And, um, and because they ha don't happen in one season, we dust ourselves off, we go the next season. Go back a year from a year ago, okay? And so um, the rationale behind appointing Stephen, it wasn't just Stephen. It was Stephen at Glass. It was Alan with a significant international uh, experience, particularly on the set pieces and striking who had been at the semi-final of the World Cup with England. And it was Scott Brown coming in with his significant experience of Scottish football, right? Plus it was Neil Simpson, moving from youth academy to being part of the first team coaching setup. And so that was the rationale behind that. Um, as far as other candidates are concerned, and uh, the reason we sped up the process was because we were at a final interview with a top candidate for the job. Um, and literally, while we were on the Zoom call with the interview, um, he, he stopped and said, listen, um, I've just accepted a role at another club in England. And one other uh, uh, group turn, um, um, <clears throat> um, also um, pulled out of the race for, for differing reason. So, look, um, that was the rationale behind that. I mean, in terms of any kind of... Um, and look, at the end of the day, if you go back to when Eddie Turnbull left Aberdeen, right? You know this. Jimmy Bondron took over and Jimmy was awful. The results, performances for four seasons. That was back in the day, Graham, where you never sacked managers. Jimmy Bondron had to resign. And, and I was there when Willie Young sacked himself by throwing his jersey in Jimmy Bondron's face. So upset was he about being substituted. And, and 
you know, you throw in for those younger um, viewers and listeners who don't know Eddie Turnbull was number one. I'm assured by players that played for him that he's the only man in the history of the world who swore more than me. Two, he was an outstanding forward for Hibs in the famous five. And um, equally, he was the man whose coaching ideas were revolutionary, won us the 1970 Scottish Cup and took us to the 67 final you talked about. But again, I'm glad you gave me an in because I don't, I'm not meaning to interrupt. Now, you and I both know, and I want to establish for the, for the viewer, I think Stephen Glass is a fine man. He was an outstanding footballer. And you and I both know that when the decision came um, to remove him, it, it, it cost you a lot personally. And there are players in the squad at Aberdeen who thought he was a good coach, who enjoyed being coached by him. My blunt question, and I think it needs answering, is retrospective, because I'm not actually giving you a time travel machine. You can't go back to March last year. But when, when you look at it retrospectively, was the combined lack of experience, because Scott Brown knew the league but hadn't coached in it, McRae had, Alan had his ideas and his work elsewhere, and Stephen had you know, some experience in MLS. But as a combined total of experience, did it cost them that they hadn't got months or years in the Scottish Premiership? Well, listen, as you say, hindsight is is a wonderful thing. And, um, you know, in, in terms of parting company with Stephen, it, it doesn't matter who it is, right? It doesn't yeah. matter what business I'm involved in. It's the hardest thing to do. But my message to Stephen was one of encouragement that um, just because one door closes, it doesn't mean to say others will open up. The margins are fine. Look, we started off the season extremely well, right? Um, and we then had the cup uh, challenge against Wraith Rovers, right? Um, we went into the fall, sorry, uh, the autumn, um, and hit that 10, 12 game streak that was a real, real challenge. You know, if I kind of look back on it, and I said this to Scott Brown, when he had applied for the St Mirren job was, Scott, wherever you get into management in Scotland, let's say it's Scotland, you need to bring on someone that's got real experience of the Scottish game. Because just as, as you are in the heat of the battle and the touch lines and stuff, if you're in the heat of the battle, it's important you've got somebody level-headed that is there. I mean, the best analogy I can give you is that um, uh, Derek McInnes had uh, Tony Doherty, you know, and Paul Sheeran, you know, and so um, I, I think kind of looking back and um, perhaps, um, you know, we could have supported Stephen um, in terms of him bringing on another full-time coach that had that kind of experience to see it through. But look, we went through that period. We got all these injuries. We went down to Ibrox and should have won. It was 2-2. Okay, okay. Hard. But on that one, on that, Dave, I'm going to ask you a pungent question. Just like all of these, you didn't know it was coming. And therefore, I know you might want to answer politically. The best football I've seen Aberdeen play for many years was for about an hour at Ibrox that day that we drew 2-2. In my opinion, and I'm saying this slowly, because you've got responsibilities to your position with the league and so on. In my opinion, we were turned over by two specific refereeing decisions that made no sense to me whatsoever. That was a quality of football that patently you thought you might be getting more regularly by appointing Stephen, whose ideas and coaching skills remain good irrespective of the fact that you had to call time on it. What as a club, if, if you feel that you've seen, we have seen refereeing decisions that, I actually don't make any sense to us and that potentially cost us a victory against the team that's now competing to be in the Europa League final. Are there mechanisms to, to complain or adjust that? Because this is not the first era when we've seen referees make decisions that confuse us very strongly. Indeed, I've chosen my words carefully there. Well, what I can tell you is, is that um, we had um, Crawford Allen, the head of the referees, come up to Aberdeen to go through this um, and, and go through those decisions and some others. What I would say, uh, being politically correct, is that um, if VAR had been in play for those two decisions, then neither of the, Rose, neither of the Rose goals would have stood. 
Thank you. That, okay, that's that's plain speaking. All of us who watch this know that this is something that's been happen- happening to Aberdeen and maybe some other clubs outside Glasgow for the longest time. If we're Alex Ferguson on this broadcast, he wouldn't be politically correct about it. He'd be studs in on the challenge. Look, okay, one of the things that does need addressing, as far as I'm concerned, um, is that Stephen Glass told me at the beginning of the season and in the summer that he was really quite happy with the change in striking options. We can see that Ramirez has worked overall. I don't think necessarily he's had the service that he needed throughout the whole, the whole season and, and maybe not even the style of play that would serve him better so that he was finishing more rather than running around less. But recruitment for a club like Aberdeen, and you indicated that the recruitment of a, a manager is difficult because you're in the midst of potentially appointing somebody when a budget bigger in England snatch them away from us. Recruiting players is difficult. And there have been some high spots for us in recent years. That's patently clear too. Darren Mowbray is the is the central figure in, in how well we recruit now. But he wasn't able to make an impact on the large majority of the summer market. Explain who he is, why he's got the job, and why wasn't he able to fundamentally influence the first half of our season? Well, first of all, Darren didn't start until September. Right of this season, which is after the window closed, right? And so, um, but again, coming back a step, one of the, 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 the key elements of the strategy, right? And, and you know that um, I've talked to some of the, the best clubs around Europe that punch above their weight, is, is to have uh, an environment in place where you've got effectively a director of football, you've got a head of recruitment, and you bring in the manager, whether it's Stephen Glass or whether it's Jim, both of these guys 100% bought into the strategy, let's play attacking, entertaining football that wins, right? That win piece is critical and hasn't happened this season. Let's bring, let's let's give the academy players uh, the opportunity to come through, really give them game time to blood them like we've done in Stephen Glass. Hallelujah. Right? Uh, and let's make investments where we're going to trans- do transfers of players. Let's invest in players where there is likely to be or a good chance that they're with us, let's say, three seasons, four seasons, and we can monetize that. So we have this conveyor belt. It's the only way that Aberdeen can be spending, which we're doing, two to three million more a year on wages, is to monetize that through player sales. I mean, you know, you just look at uh, Sevilla, Villarreal, and these teams, and you take a look in Scandinavia, how these teams actually do that. But, but let me come back and say, Stephen Gunn, who's been with the club 20 years, right? Stephen was managing everything on the football side except for the first team, first team and the um, uh, first team environment and everything that went with that. And historically in Aberdeen, maybe other than the time Willie Miller was here um, with Mark McGee, um, the first time, the manager of the club, all of the recruitment and all of the hiring and firing, so to speak, player-wise. So what we want to be in a position to do is set a high-level strategy. So within that strategy of playing attacking, entertaining football, I mean, that's it. The site, whether Stephen Glass or whether um, Jim Goodwin were going to play 4-3-3, 4-2-3-1, I mean, that's their, their call. So coming back to it, though, um, Stephen Gunn was put in place in July. So Stephen was put into the director of football position in July. The recruitment last summer was 100% done by the management team, which is Stephen Glass and his team team of guys, right? And so the, that was the window last, last summer. This window that we just went past in January, notoriously the January window is the toughest of window to bring in Correct. quality. No so, argument. So let me just address that because I know it's been a, an issue that's raised by a lot of the fans. So in January, we made a decision to go for quality and not quantity. Backstep a year to the previous January, three strikers come in, it's significant investment on the last day of the window and score three goals the rest of the season, not each between them. And so as we went into that window, we still uh, come out of that window We Calvin Ramsey still here. Right, Lewis Ferguson still here. The, in, in other words, Dave, hold on, be clear about that. Are you saying still here because you turned down offers? We 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 could have we could have moved those players on should we wanted to. Right. So, 
That's a weekend. yes. There were offers. Yes. Okay. 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 Sorry to interject, but I think in terminology that we use maybe in daily work or in boardrooms or whatever, I think for, for fans, sometimes it's it's useful just to break it down. I'm, I've broken your flow, though. So we, we finished the market so, with, with Calvin Ramsey so, still there, for example. Ferguson still there. Yeah. So in September, when um, Darren Mowbray arrived as head of recruitment, right, then he came into the role knowing exactly how the club is defined, you know, how we're going to play, and, and, and kind of the thoughts and the positions that, that may be required, particularly January, but in particular this, this summer. So historically, I, I think it's fairly well known that we've, we've really tried to punch above our weight with lower league in England. So what Darren brings to the table is a premiership, significant premiership background. So one of the first things he's done since September last year coming in, he has been to Slovakia, Czech Republic. He's been to Poland. He's been to Germany. He's been to Holland six times, I believe, or more, in countries like that, to give us a perspective on the quality, the league versus Scottish league, and the type of players that may translate. If it was not for Stephen Gunn, it was not for Darren Mowbray, we would not have had Vicente here. Okay? That's fine. We, we invested half a million euros in cash for Vicente as a 20-year-old player with a significant future on a four-and-a-half-year contract. So going back to the January window, we did have money available for a striker, but there was no quality that came our way, and the decision was made to keep our powder dry for this um, summer. Okay, let me, let me, I think, guide you to something I think needs explaining. You, you talked about Munchie and Sevilla. Again, not everybody watching this will be as au fait with life in Spain as, as I am, or perhaps you or, or, or Stephen. Munchi was a footballer, um, maybe not the best footballer, a goalkeeper. When they were relegated in 2000, the president said, will you take over the football directorship? He knew nothing about what he's doing. He's probably earned <clears throat> Sevilla in the 22 years, or if you minus a couple of years at Roma, 20 years since then. He's probably earned the club in the region of 600 million in transfer money surplus and during his reign they've become record winners of the Europa League that's clearly what I think we will do it's probably what you want to do I've got because I still believe that you know a league title is just around the corner but but back without even a smile on my voice now you had a you had a I was urging you to, to go and speak to him because he is the best and what's more he's willing to share the process of how he's constructed the football side and the transfer side of his club. And, and you trumped me and said that you'd, you'd been for a talk. Yeah, so I think what's important, the, the amount of data that's available today on players and on coaching styles and, and access is, is incredible. So I, I'm pretty curious about how we, we improve things at Aberdeen. So Stephen Gunn in particular, you know, has set about talking to the top people in Europe. Listen, we all know La Liga with the broadcasting income trumps Scotland by whatever it is, okay? So, so that's a given. But in terms of the strategy we've got, Stephen in particular, right now we're talking to a top Serie A team, right? Because, why? Because they've got 40 players out in loan, right? Not all these players are going to play for this team, Right? And there are players that won't fit the Scottish style, but some players might. So, and again, Stephen's been in the role for less than a year, right? And Darren's been in the role for seven months. But the idea of going out and, and scouting, the, so for example, when Darren goes out to Slovakia, he's taken in three games, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, typically. So you're getting bang for buck in terms of watching players real time. Um, and I'll come back to the recruitment again, getting ready for this season as well, which I'd like to, but spending time with Sevilla and their style, their approach, right? We can tap into the investment that Monchi and these people have made by looking at the things they do well. Stevie Archibald, right? Stevie Archibald, we continue to chat with Stevie about potential players in Spain that can come to Aberdeen, right? It's, it's uh, a good decision. He lives around the corner from me. I speak to him regularly, and um, two things he's not lost. His, his commercial brain, he's hard-nosed, look out. But boy, he knows horse flesh. He knows 
proper decision making in the market. That man is different gravy as oh, well. Oh yeah, as listen, legend. Stevie, Stevie is Stevie, and um, I mean, um, you, there's no, you're never left confused of what he thinks. You know, he gets his opinion across, doesn't he? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I do remember. I don't think a true story. I never asked Steve about it. That apparently when Mark McGee and and him talked about um, years after they got he'd gone to Hamburg and uh, Mark Hamburg and and Stevie to Barcelona that. Stevie had said to, to Mark, why did you go to Hamburg? He said, well, I fancied a different league, a bit of culture, nice part of Europe, et cetera. So why did you go to Barcelona? He said, they offered me a Rolls Royce. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've been in that. But listen, if you're going to move away from West Hill, it, it's going to take, you know, Northland or Barcelona for sure. And um, okay, So Graham, to- just back to the point is, is that um, there's, we now have, rather than just maybe looking at England, we've got work going on across Europe. We're going to be adding another full-time scout that works for Darren um, as well. And um, they need to be given an opportunity. This summer, we go into this summer, I believe, strongly. So, for example, yesterday we got a text from um, Theo Snelders. There's a player we really like in Holland. And... This player is friends with Theo's son, and the boy went to, to, to Theo's house to ask him about Aberdeen. One of the reasons we got Vicente versus other clubs like Hibs that were interested is because of our Dutch connections. Now, we are able to demonstrate there through our history, Dutch players coming in doing well. Still got a lot of love for, you know, for Aberdeen. But um, moving on to the recruitment for this, this summer, um, Jim, Jim Goodwin... And Jim was final say, players going, players coming. And so Jim, working closely with Stephen Gunn and, and Darren Mowbray, I can tell you that in the last few weeks, most nights of the week, the last two, three weeks, they've been on Zoom calls with players on their own, with their agents, basically wanting them to come to Aberdeen. Now, again, coming back a step, Barcelona, there might be 30 players in the world can make a difference for them. 30 to 50 players, Man United, Real Madrid. For us, there's about two and a half thousand players globally, right? And so and now that we're looking at all of that, particularly Europe expansion that we talked about and Atlanta's uh, ability to tap into South America, you know, we're, we're, we're going broad now as well as deep where we see uh, opportunity. But, but they get on a Zoom call with this player. We're able to demonstrate to them, show them a, a video of Aberdeen, of the training ground, a kind of tunnel walkthrough of the club or history, what we're about. And then Jim Goodwin is saying to the player, not only has Darren Mowbray watched you three times in, in the flesh playing, I've watched five hours, five hours of a video of you as a player. This is these are the systems we play. This is how we see you fitting in. So that if the player has any doubts at all, he goes, this is a club that isn't just trying to buy me because an agent's involved. Or maybe I've had a couple of good games. Man, they understand what I've come to and they've got a vision for how I play. Is that is that what you're expressing? Yeah. And listen, I'm not involved in that. This is Stephen Gunn. Darren I understand. Mowbray. This is understand. Jim. But, but it's important as a director of a club or chairman of a club to be inquisitive and to ask questions of what we're doing it could be commercially deals it could be on the football side that's the job of of a of a director but go on go on so so for me um you know i look back at this period um the thing what have we done well in the last few years as i've been involved with the club lewis ferguson tremendous um, signing, right? Um, and an investment. You know, we paid a quarter of a million. Um, Good long-term contract as well, so right. we can fight off bidders. And, and then, and then, obviously as well, Ross McCrory are good examples. I think that people will eventually will see the value of a twenty-year-old player um, in Vicente that we invested in. But the other part to this is the youth academy. Two years ago, I'll go back eighteen months ago, right? then, you know, the Youth Academy is about the coaches. It's about the players and, and the parents have a huge say in their kids and what they do. And we had to unlock that situation where the players, the coaches, parents were feeling that the boys were never going to get a chance 
in the first team other than a cameo. And so now, and, and give Stephen Glass his due, he's blooded some of these guys. And it's it, and Jim feels exactly the same way. Well, that's and, reassuring because I, I have to button and say that you, you'd be the same. I feel this way. I think the majority of dandies will feel this way. There is no question about the difference Derek McInnes and Tony Dot made to our club. No, dif- no, no discussion. They made a difference. Uh, one of the things that significantly made me feel that change was the best, probably for them as a coaching staff and us as a club, is the real chance that academy boys were given. That, that Number one, they were promoted. Number two, they were given a length of time during which they learn. They don't just demonstrate that they're Ballon d'Or winners the first time they step on the pitch for the senior team. They needed to, and they, we needed a coaching staff that said, the academy is central to us. It was clear that, that Stephen Glass felt that. I'm, I'm glad you say the new manager has got that. I, I want to ask you, one is opinion, and again, it's a pungent one. It's a difficult one. There's one player in our squad who's picking up a medal this season, and that's for Kelty. Could and should Connor Barron, if 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 things had been different, if Stephen had been appointed sooner, if Darren maybe had a voice in it, whatever, for whatever reason, could and should Connor Barron have been playing for us from the start of the season? Because my eyes tell me that the answer is yes. Well, I think, listen, as Stephen came into the role with, with, with Scott Brown, etc., these guys saw the, saw the talent that the boy had last summer at, at their training. But the decision was made, I think rightly, that he go out and get play every minute of every game, you know, on loan. And um, but the plan was to review it, which they did in, in, in December, January, to bring him back. But, um, you know, Corin, Connor... Um, clearly has a lot to learn, but tremendous potential. But you need to give these guys the opportunity to to excel. And sometimes that means they go out and loan. Um, Neil Simpson is managing the loan program. So we don't just go and say, a club comes to us and says, can we get this player? Okay, you take him, right? They go there for a reason, right? It's because of a style of play, position they're going to play. They're going to play Kieran Nguyenia, right? Kieran's done, still doing really well, the left back Correct. at Kelty. And so similarly, Ryan Duncan, Ryan Duncan in December could have come into the first team squad as a player, right? But the decision uh, by the football, uh, the football and um, management team was to um, let him go to Peterhead, where he's doing really, really, really well for Peterhead. He'll be in the first team squad for next year. But that's progress. D- Dean Campbell, as far as uh, you know? I, I don't know. I don't know. Dean is obviously out on loan at Kilmarnock. Dean is still uh, an Aberdeen player, but that's going to be Jim. That's going to be Jim's call. Um, okay, I ask because I'm enthusiastic about it, and we're on the subject of recruitment. Let me ask one more thing. That is again, it, it, it's more Dave. I, I, I'll be upfront with you. I'm asking you it, for what you feel about football, for what you feel about boys playing in the dandies' colours. In recruitment, and this is what this is what Monchi's been so successful at, and, and I think you described a structure which we're replicating, whereby the manager always always has final say. But if a manager comes or goes, we're not, you know, all the players don't go with them, all the ideas don't go with them. We've got a central column of this is what we play like, this is what we, how we want to recruit, this is the type of people we want to see running around in our boots and our strip. Tactical things, Jim's decisions aside. I want to put it to you. If you look at some of the displays this season um, and last season, is one of the criteria for those that recruit for our club buying players with a little bit more bite who don't get pushed around. Players who, when a day, when an afternoon is going badly and there's 1,400 dandies travel to wherever it may be, they absolutely know that a player's shoulders won't slump, that his technical ability, his value, the, the wages, his previous profile, all of those are right up the list of criteria. Let's not get it wrong. We're not buying fighters. But I, I do believe, again, looking at it, that there is a, an element of DNA that we need to build into our, our recruitment gradually that says, this, this guy's up for it. This guy's up for it. Like, for example, McCrory and Ferguson are, like Calvin Ramsey and McKenzie are, like Conor Barron is. Well, look, I think that, um, first of all, um, if we look back over the last few years, um, our recruitment, I think, could have been better. One of the reasons we put the strategy in place, right, with, with um, 
Uh, Darren coming on board, putting Stephen in that position is to get more structure and clarity about who we are and what we're about. And Jim Goodwin is 100% bought into that. So all I can tell you is what Jim Goodwin has said, and it's uh, Jim's call with these guys is that he wants to reduce the average age of the squad. Why? Because he wants to play a pressing game. And to play a pressing game, you need younger players. On average, younger players are able to execute that for 90 minutes. And so it's Jim's call working with these guys right now to revamp the squad for next season. And, um, and, and he's, as he said himself, he is a significant. This isn't because of investment, Graham. I mean, the investment is there in the wage bill and the transfer fees that we've gone through. Again, it's been a really, really uh, tough season for us. Um, and But look, the only thing we can do is dust ourselves off, make appropriate changes, which we think we've done, mm -hmm. and then get ready for next season. Remember, we've been in existence last, last week for 119 years, right? We have won trophies, I think, in about 15 or 16 seasons, half of which was Sir Alec Ferguson. Now, that's not an excuse. We haven't won the Scottish Cup for 32 years. We've won one cup in 27 years, right? The vision, the strategy, I believe, is the right one, footballing-wise, and we haven't touched on the commercial side at all yet, right? We've had a bad season. It doesn't mean to say that the strategy and vision is wrong and... I'm a cup half full kind of guy. We get going again next season. I'm on this call, not because I'm a supporter and not because you've employed me. I feel optimistic too. I can see the core things going correctly. Let's take a time out and talk about something that isn't a process. It was a one-off. You decided to commission a statue of uh, Fergie. It's a brilliant piece of work. You decided to get him up to Pataudry. You somehow arranged literally stunning weather and a performance the next day against the Arabs, which had everything except for the six goals that we merited. Um, flipping football. Football bloody hell, as Alex said. Your reflections on how that weekend went, what Fergie left behind in terms of advice, affection, and, and how it looked to the world, because it had taken too long for us to honour Alex Ferguson. And when you decided to do it, this isn't flattery. I was there. It, it, the, it, the club did it brilliantly. Well, first of all, like you alluded to, it was long kind of overdue. And, you know, and, and as part of um, becoming chairman, you know, um, it's one of the, the pieces of um, projects, if you like, to work with the Heritage Trust to be able to line up recognizing our history. I mean, not just over the last 50 years, but you got Donald Coleman, but so many people um, over that time. And, and clearly the, the, the clear, the clear uh, decision, first of all, was to recognize Sir Alex. Um, you know, I was in Rob Wicks um, and the team at the club, I thought we demonstrated off the field, so to speak, what we're capable of doing. And that that weekend, I uh, commended everybody at the club. They pulled off a tremendous weekend. Yes, the weather did, um, the weather, we were blessed by, by the weather. Unfortunately, you know, the, the result the next day should have been a win, but you know, it spilt milk, it, it happened. But what I would say this is I think Sir Alex had been actually um, in Madrid for the Atletico game with Manchester United the previous two nights. And he's a very busy man. And um, he landed in Aberdeen, probably not having much time to think about what was about to come. And he was genuinely, genuinely blown away by um, what happened on the Friday and the Saturday. And I just, I mean, you know, all of us at the club, the board, staff, everybody, supporters, were just... Um, delighted to be able to do it. And I think again, it's another measure of um, what we need to think about as a club as we move to a new stadium and we'll be able to move Sir Alex's statue. In fact, I was, I was in at the Aberdeen University. I caught up with George Boyne, um, who runs Aberdeen University, and he's got a big, 
picture on his wall of Gothenburg, and he's been gone for Aberdeen for years. I think he was at, at Cardiff for, for years, but his picture's there. And he had taken a picture outside Pitodri of a tour bus that stopped. Now the tour buses are stopping as a landmark in Aberdeen. So he took a picture. I haven't got it from him yet. He took a picture of people taking pictures of the statue. Nice. Nice. Right. And I haven't told Sir Alex about that yet, but it's now a it's now a, a destination that and, and no doubt the Dennis Law statue as well. But I think we showed that weekend what the club is capable of. And it's 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 an example of with the fan engagement and with the things we've done with the red shed, with the things that we've done, the beach ballroom last weekend. I wish you could have been there. Seven hundred and fifty fans, families were there phenomenal um, success to demonstrate that, you know, as we um, get towards a new stadium, that we can make it an experience, an entertainment, come here at 11 o'clock, enjoy some hospitality that, um, you know, is reasonably priced, which is important. And I learned that from what Atlanta have done here with Mercedes-Benz. So, um, but going back to it, um, we're now, going to be working with the Heritage Trust to take a look at, um, for the next 10 years, how we recognise, um, you know, our, our legends. We've got Gothenburg 40th year next year, which is upcoming. And we are, um, we are, um, uh, the club is, I mean, listen, it takes a lot of effort to pull these things off. Particularly right? to do it that well. Yeah. I, I, and so, I, you know, I've lived in, Glasgow, London, Barcelona, I've travelled the world, I've been at World Cup finals. D to do something, even a contained event like that, with such class, I know it takes structure and effort and planning and vision. And to meet Alex standards, given that he was describing his underpants that he wore the day that he did that famous pose against Tibbs to the sculptor. You know, let's let's not talk about detail when we're, when we're talking about... Um, well, listen, Alex I tell you, he has, his memory is unbelievable. We had a, a private dinner on the Friday night for some of his friends and some of the directors. And, um, you know, I, he corrected me. I remember the Youth Cup final 1984, where um, Sir Alex was in, in the stand and um, they were, we were down 3 0 to Celtic at half time. And um, anyway, uh, it, it's a kind of legendary that Sir Alex went to the dressing room at half time. At the end of full time, it was 3-3, okay? And I said, yes, and we went on to win 4-3. And he said, no, you're wrong, it was 5-3. And he told me who the scorers were. And unbelievable. Mr. Alex that was 88 last December 31st. And um, yeah. You did the right thing, Brian. Listen, uh, it's important that you tell the, not tell the truth, but you, you get both the negative and positive from your fan engagement. Because the beach ballroom, you know, was a success. It came after a brutal day on the pitch. But you've been attempting to speak to fan groups, to, to sponsors. And I want you to communicate, not just... Because if you look at our numbers, our numbers at Pataudry generally have been exceptional, given the quality of football they've watched. Our travelling numbers, I'm still hugely proud of. And they're noisy and, and they seem to believe in general. But there, you will have encountered people saying, I haven't liked this, I don't want that, as well as saying, I believe, or well done on Jim Goodman, well done on Conor Barrow, whatever. You, you must represent a mixture of what you've found while you've been in Aberdeen. And I want you also to speak to the idea that it's a difficulty for the club that you're in partly in Atlanta, partly in Aberdeen. Yeah, well, well, let's, um, well first of all, let's, let's talk about um, me being in Atlanta and in Aberdeen. I'm in Aberdeen for a few months of the year, let's say three months of the year, throughout the year at the right times, not typically pre-season. Um, if the one thing we've all learned through COVID is that media like this, Zoom calls, right, and, 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 and um, employees or staff or team members are, um, can be all over the place. There's hardly too many people back, even at Pataudry just now, um, people are working remotely. But look, um, this has been for almost five years for me, right? Initially, the first good period of time on the commercial side, revamping the commercial side. And um, I'll happily come on to the fact that um, in terms of certain income streams, we're up a million a year in that short period of time. Um, 
but and 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 how we think about kind of season tickets and and those kind of campaigns. But for me, um, I'm on this medium all the time with everybody at the club. But what I will say is this: off the field, we hired Rob Wicks. Um, Rob started um, in February um, of 2018. I can't believe he's been here for over four years. And Rob brought with him a non-football background, which we liked because it gives you a different perspective. And as commercial director, his, his background in motorsports and the last 10 years, well, pre, the 10 years before he came to us was in powerboat racing. And he it grew that by 300% in 10 years. And so Rob has brought a discipline and experience and revamped the sales and marketing team um, today where, you know, for example, we're a million up um, on certain income streams. Um, and some of that is, is recent as well. It's the, the new announcements we make on the shirt sponsor, et cetera. Um, we have expanded to have partners as logistics partners. Um, we, uh, GAC, uh, also a healthcare partner in Health Shield that's bringing in significant, significant uh, money. So Rob is a very capable executive with good team beneath him. Uh, Kevin McIver, Kevin has been on board um, probably started six months after Rob as our finance director, and again has brought a discipline to uh, what we're uh, uh, set about. We're sitting here, and the bulk of my time right now is spent on how do we find 75 to 85 million, one, for a new stadium, and two, to expand what we'd like to do at Cormac Park for an indoor pitch. Right? Uh, also, uh, also, how did we do during lockdown? How did you? How well did you do in retaining staff? Well, I think we, we said it a number of times. We we set out because going into lockdown, right? We had set our stall out, and everybody had to go through COVID. But Aberdeen went through COVID, already committed to spending over two million a year more on the football budget, right? And so, but but off the field. Um, we, were, we felt we were in a really strong position. We needed everybody in the positions we were in in order to drive season tickets, uh, commercial income, et cetera. And remember the Aberdeen DNA initiative, which nets about after discount 700,000 a year as well, which was introduced in 2018. All of that you know, is a significant help clearly uh, to the club. But we went into that having town halls with the staff and saying to them, we can't guarantee this, but our goal is to come through COVID without making anybody redundant as a result of COVID. And we achieved that. And you see, before, before people, you know, before the modern anger, listen, I'm not a sap. If I'm, on a, if I'm at a game and I see my team not playing well, usually I'll give it out to the opposition, the referee first, but I'm not without my, you know, the natural disappointment and anger that floods from it. But we live, particularly in social media, in a really angry society. And for my taste, I'm proud of what you've just said there. I want us to be challenging for the league, lifting a trophy soon, and, and, and have a better quality of academy and, and signed players. But the fact that you achieved that, the fact that you delivered meals to the community and looked after the community, I personally don't want that to be overlooked or forgotten. Because, you know, when the final counts come to what a club's worth, as you say, we, we won't be and can't be lifting the treble every year. B but ideas like that and ability of carrying those ideas out like that, for my taste, matter a great deal. Now, I've given you a compliment, not a question, but I'm, anybody who can't see I'm speaking from the heart, you know, isn't paying proper attention. Well, it wasn't just me. I mean, at the end of the day... I mean, you the club, Dave. I'm not yeah. talking about you. This is not hagiography. I'm talking about Aberdeen football. Yeah. Well, the, the community trust is critical to us. And one of the reasons I got back involved in the club was to try and give, which they have now a 22 year lease, the community trust at no charge at Cormac Park to generate income from the use of the playing pitches that are there. Because I think at the heart of this, you know, as a club, we're a family club, we've got real ambition. Um, not every year is gonna be a success. I'd be, be wrong to, to not say that I've been gutted by this season, but you know what? Um, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a strong character. I understand the fury of some people 
and, and everybody's entitled to their position. But the only way for us to go forward is to get forward together, to make the necessary changes that we need to make um, to be successful you know, on the field. But if I can give you an example of something else I'm proud the team has gone forward with. Two years ago, not one primary school kid in Aberdeen or Aberdeenshire was a member of the football club. We're right on 9,000 right now, okay? We've got all the data, right? And so these kids get two free vouchers, probably more, I think, um, come out for, for games. Um, and what we know now is, is that for every free voucher that we give to a kid, there's almost like 75% of an adult ticket paid for, not one for one. But what we have to do, and, and, and what you will have seen across social media as well, is, is that those parents and grandparents come into Petaudry through the front door, through the dressing room, into the major room. They sign for the dons, photo shoot, video shoot, out to the pitch. And as a seven-year-old, right, you're nurturing that kid to be an Aberdeen fan for life. And so I, I, we have to, as a board, think of the longer term, right? I mean, Graham, I'm sitting here spending, like I said, 80% of my time trying, trying to get 75 million. And you know what? Our season ticket income hasn't changed in five years. It's about 2 million after VAT we bring in because we've made it a, a particularly palatable for um, younger kids to come in uh, to the club season ticket wise, but we think it's the right strategy. And so I haven't said this, nobody said this at the club, given the season we've had. Would you believe that this season, we sold more paid for, not complimentary, paid for season tickets this season than the club has in its history? Just over 9,000 paid season tickets, right? We're Explain, what do you put that down to? I put that down to the work that the strategy and the work that we are, 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 are doing in nurturing people to give back and come to Petaudry as an experience and to believe in what we're trying to achieve. And, and, and tells and, you a little bit about your public though, because it's apparent that as, you know, as, as determined as your marketing is, as, as clear as your message is, there has to be a community there that is aching for the dandies to, to be a, a good day out whether on the road or watching red TV or, or, or at Petodji. And there has to be a community there that, that deeply cares about the men with two stars in the jersey, the only club in Scotland with two UEFA stars in the jersey. There's a community there that is dying for you to achieve the things that the strategy, that the appointments, that the changes, albeit this has been a, a pretty horrible experience as a season. The community out there is thirsty for what you're trying to build. Well, look, I, I think so. And look, again, people will look at this season. Yes, it's a results business. But as a board, right, we have to look for longer term at the club. And because you have a bad season, you don't go and bury your head. You say, oh, how can we do things better moving forward? We've sold 6,300 season tickets for this next season coming, even with a season that we have, we have had. And in particular the younger generation have been significant in that. So for example, if you're a DNA member and under 12, the season ticket is 24 pounds. Not a game, 24 pounds for the whole season. If you're not a DNA member, I think it's like 50 quid. And so, um, and so you know, from that perspective, you know, I, I, again, if you think there's, 40, there's 43,000 primary school kids in Aberdeen, Aberdeenshire, 9,000 are members of the club now. We want to get to 15,000 in the next two years. You do that. Eight, 10 years time from now, the next generation, that should help us build affinity, right, when there's other things to do. You get a new stadium with the entertainment and the pregame stuff that we can do. So we're at 6,300 season tickets sold, right? The last day of the... Um, window the freeze of season ticket prices for last year it was a record day in the club's history something like 1500 season tickets sold in one day so look um it's, it takes everybody you know it's not my club right i mean at the end of the day um stuart 
was at this for 22 years. And for 22 years, there was nobody else put their head above the parapet in Aberdeen to want to be, um, you know, figurehead involved. There's very few people can actually, has got the, the, the wealth to do it. But the majority of people that could be involved with the club want nothing to do with the club for fear of retribution to them and their families in the city because it's a goldfish bowl. And so that's for me- the, That's one of the worst things I've heard anybody tell me in an interview ever. You know, that's disgusting. But, well, but look, it, it is what it is. But you know what? 99% of the people out there are great people. And for me, I simply want to be um, not just a cheerleader. I want, to, I want to talk our club up. And if we don't do well, my responsibility, I'll take it on the chin. But boy, um, you know, it's a competitive event. Hearts and Hibs are doing a great job off the field now as well. And good competition. Yes, they got more season ticket holders than us. So what? But at the end of the day, I believe in what we're doing. And I think the vast majority, the silent majority, believe in it. Yes, this season, really tough. But let's 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 wind up on, on three things. <clears throat> You've mentioned it a few times, and, and I know that there are organizations and people who would take your time away from the dandies and take your investment away from the dandies if you could be persuaded if <laughs> to do so, which please God you you won't be. How the hell in this financial climate, right? First of all, I think if the new stadium hadn't been in the same area as it is now, my opinion is it would have been a death knell for the club. You break habits. People don't go as readily. We haven't lifted trophies. Which I think that the decision to for Petodri to be at or around the beach was essential. So my perspective is thanks for that. How the hell does a 75 million stadium get funded and built in this economic climate? Well, it's... Uh... It's I mean, two things keep me awake at night, right? Obviously, performances, Sorry about that. <laughs> performances right? Yeah. I'm like a regular fan. And secondly, is how we solve this issue. Um, look, we could build a very basic stadium for a lot less, but, and we've employed some of the best um, people that do new stadium in terms of evaluating what you should have in the new stadium, what the uplift of turnover can be. But if we want to build a quality stadium where we can uplift our income by three to 4 million a year because we've got better facilities, then that's what it's gonna take. I mean, it's gone, I mean, listen, remember it's five years since yeah. we thought it might be 40 to 50, 45 million to build the stadium, five yeah. years, during which the, particularly over the last two years with COVID, Construction inflation, I mean, the cost of timber, the cost of steel, labour. Brexit hasn't helped. Brexit hasn't oh, helped. And, and prices do. don't go down. But, but so, look, I, I mean, that's my, my role there. So we have to look at, um, you know, obviously the, 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 the cost of, of the land we get at Petodri is of value, right? Um, and by the way, the, 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 the beach opportunity to build a stadium there was never there before. I will say this, in my opinion, this is the best relationship Aberdeen Football Club has had with the City Council in decades. I, I can That's tell important. you that, that I mean, as an Aberdonian, first time I walked down Union Street um, in years was about six months ago. I almost cried, you know? I mean, it's- You don't it, need to sell me that ticket. It's, it's a ghost yeah. town and it's so, a disgrace. But, but you know, we need to, as a city, make a significant investment in the city centre to get people living there again, because a lot of the retail stores won't come back. We need to be able to see that roundabout at Castle Gate that goes down to the beach, not seen as Hadrian's Wall, so you can't get anywhere. And we yeah. need to open the book. All of the plans that are already out there are phenomenal, right? The football club is a significant factor economically in anything the council does down at the beach. So we're in the midst right now of going through a detailed business case ourselves and with the city council as to what gets built, when it gets built. And so grants are gonna be important for us as well. 
we've said all along, we want this to be a net zero stadium. There are significant infrastructure grants from the, the British government, we hope from the Scottish government. If we have a fully heated and powered, fully heated and powered, not partially, we could be the first in Europe to have you know, a, a net zero based uh, stadium. And you think about it, you know, Aberdeen is moving from the old fossil fuel economy of oil to being hopefully the uh, renewable energy capital uh, of the world. And so it's important the stadium you know, is, is, is part of that process. I obviously uh, am out there trying to, to raise investment um, associated with um, the development as well. But um, yes, I, I, I'm up for it. I will give it my absolute best shot, but I do think, I do think um, being at the beach, as you mentioned earlier, is, is absolutely critical. You, you, you've, saved, you've saved our club's life. In my opinion, those of you who made that decision saved our club's life. The, la the last thing I want to ask, no, the second last thing I want to ask you, Dave, is um, let's be blunt. I have not lost any faith in the decision-making of the club and this current manager, but the results haven't notably been better yet. What have you learned about the man you appointed since you appointed him? He is he clearly presents well. He's got a, a convincing rhetoric. It's clear that he's articulate. There's a bearing, there's a character there. I understand all of that. I speak to people who support St. Mirren, have done regularly since he became on the radar. And people speak well about his ability to instill a disciplined attacking brand of football. I don't doubt any of that. What I specifically mean, what have you learned about the man that you've appointed since you appointed him? I think that, um, to be honest, that um, um, in interviewing Jim and spending a significant amount of time with him, myself and other directors, um, the man that we saw in that interview is the man um, that, uh, that is working for this club day by day. Jim is a determined um, individual has got a clear um, buy-in to the philosophy that we have got. And I don't think um, anybody um, will be in, in any doubt that he uh, is running the football team. Okay. I, I feel that's a, a euphemistic answer, but it's a good one. We're going to close because this has been longer than either I had expected and we didn't plan this, but there's a there's a quick fire round, Chairman, and it's a quick fire round, and I'm asking you very simple questions. How many clubs, Dave Cormack, in Scotland have got two European stars? Just the one, Aberdeen Football Club. Who? Thank you very much. Who's your favourite ever dandy? Joe Harper. <sighs> the King of the North. Your favourite ever away day trip? Gothenburg. 11th of May, 1983. Should the dandies... I should say, I should say, closely followed by Easter Road, 1980. Then your favourite ever goal that any Aberdeen team you've been watching has scored? That has to be John Hewitt. Couldn't believe John's header, you know? We Johnny Augustine punching the air. We Johnny nodding in off Mark McGee's cross. And... The last one is, and this is a cheeky one, while you remain chairman of Aberdeen, how many trophies realistically would you like to see us lifting? Realistically. Well, that's a, that's a, how long am I going to be chairman? <laughs> right, right now, as far as I'm concerned, given the quality of this interview, as long as you like. Yeah. Well, listen, um, I think we should go out every season with a goal of trying to win a trophy. Will we win a trophy every season? History says uh, not. But I think every, certainly every three, four, five years, we should be trying to win a trophy. And listen, it's an aspiration, right? And this season has been, as I said, has been tough for everybody. But, yeah, you know, i got broad shoulders. Um, and we'll go again. It's a good answer. I feel differently. Not only should we, but I think we will um, have two or three trophies over the next four years. 
I've got absolute belief. I think that the academy will be the, the engine of those victories. Um, I'll close by saying I meant every word when I came on this. I, 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 following Aberdeen has literally changed my aspirations, the aggressive, competitive nature with which I approached life. Um, I live or breathe on their results. People ask me in Spain all the time, ah, but you must have a favourite Spanish club. Uh, do I? That can be buzzed out. The Dandies are um, the club that I love. I'm so pleased um, to hear the ideas you've got because without this strategy, without that experience, without these ideas, you and your team, this interview hasn't been all about Dave Connor. When I've said you, I'm talking about you, the dandies, you, the team of people around you. But I'm on this interview because I believe, um, I'm, I'm proud of what we're doing, and I think our time is coming. It's been a blip. It's been sometimes unpleasant to watch, but my belief remains firm. Um, Dave Cormack, thank you for letting me speak to you on Aberdeen Television. And to everybody who's watching, up the dandies. Up the dandies. Thanks, Graham.